special meeting of the Pittsburgh City Commission is called to order. Uh, we will proceed with consent agenda as we have no other thing above that. I have a question. Sure. Mayor, should we not say the Pledge of Allegiance even though this is a special meeting? Or? Uh, you know, it would be fine with me. Is that okay, Henry? Yeah. You're not. Okay. okay. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So we open this meeting with the consent agenda. Is there anything that anyone wants to remove? Hearing none, I move for approval. A second. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Been moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Chenoweth? Aye. McNally? Aye. McNay? Aye. Munsell? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Special presentations. Downtown Advisory Board Annual Report. Michael Feenan, representing the Downtown Advisory Board, will present their annual report. How's it going? Good evening. Hi. Hey. <laughs> I want to thank, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Commission, for inviting the Board in this evening to catch you all up on what has been going on over the past year, what we've started on this year, and what plans we have moving forward. Um, for those of uh, you who don't know or anybody listening at home, my name is Michael Feenan. I am the chairman for the Downtown Advisory Board for 2019. So you'll probably have to listen to me talk again sometime in the future, and I apologize for those times as well. Uh, so first off, uh, I'll have some time at the end if there's any questions, comments, direction you want to give the board at all um, at the end, please let me know uh, whatever we can do for you. Uh, 2018 um, opened for us. Our big thing that kind of anchored that year when we started was the lot over on 5th Street, of course. Um, that was brought to us to review options for what we could do with that. Um, we know that that did not go maybe as smoothly as some folks had hoped, perhaps, and uh, we learned from that a great deal. And uh, I want to assure everybody that we took a lot of what we heard through that process to heart. Uh, we did pay attention to conversations that were going on both on Facebook, in person, and took those things, made modifications to our own internal processes uh, to make, just to make sure that folks felt confident in the decision-making processes that we used and that we felt confident in reassuring people that, you know, we were making good decisions, basically. We had confidence in that, but we wanted to make sure that that outwardly felt the same way. Uh, part of that uh, was a change we made internally to just slow down these decisions. Um, we know that you know this will be a rare occurrence for us, uh, that kind of, uh, of opportunity to review something like that. But taking that time, bringing in more public input uh, early on, that's something that's going to come up here in a couple minutes that you'll see that reflected in some of the things that we're doing. Um, and then we also scheduled some time to sit down with the land bank board and learn more from them about the land we have downtown, how that stuff is processed, what opportunities are there, and to just increase our own education as far as those policies and procedures and things that take place um, on their side of the ball so that, again, when this stuff comes up again, we will have some better teeth to bite into it, so to speak. Um, so that was, that was important for us to learn and grow through that. It was also one of the first really big, high-profile things that the board got to be involved in. Our board is still relatively new, and that was something you know, very big for us to take on. Uh, the second deal was uh, something the commission uh, passed that we recommended, which was the introduction of common consumption downtown. This uh, was the implementation of a state-level law that let us work with uh, the state ABC to figure out a way to implement in a more creative fashion than maybe was intended originally, but apply this to our downtown district to increase opportunities for both bar owners, events that get held downtown, um, and give the community more options in terms of how you know, they celebrate different events. Um, that so far has been very successful for us. We've had limited opportunities. Um, Art Walk is the big one that has taken advantage of that, and they are planning on doing it again uh, uh, this April, next month, uh, on the 20th, if anybody is interested, I think. Maybe wrong. 19th? 20th? 26th. 26th. They know, not me. Uh, <laughs> too many numbers in my head. 
Um, we were the first city in the state of Kansas to apply the common consumption law in the way that we did. Um, nobody else had taken the approach of using a district for that. Um, that took a lot of back and forth. I give a lot of credit to Jay and Darren and those folks for talking to ABC. Um, the p uh, police department in particular was integral in helping us understand the concerns. Um, Lieutenant Tompkins came in and uh, used some of his time to speak with us on that and make sure that we knew you know, what concerns they had, ways we could address some of those things. Um, and they were absolutely instrumental in helping that be successful. Um, and in general, we've had positive experiences with that. Um, conversations with uh, bar owners downtown who took part. Conversations with just community members who were downtown during Art Walk and enjoyed that. Um, and no problems. That's the big part. Everybody, of course, had concerns about you know, what happens if. And we didn't have any of those ifs. Uh, and so that was, again, through both the implementation of the rules, cooperation with the bar owners, and, of course, the police department and the oversight they gave us. Um, so that was uh, a big deal. And we hope to see that uh, in August. I believe that comes up for renewal. Um, and I think we will very likely be recommending that you continue to uh, renew that license. Uh, the other big thing, the real big thing, really, was the downtown design standards. Uh, so we... Uh, put together through the incredibly hard work of our uh, infrastructure committee, built out a set of design standards for the downtown overlay district to help sort of guide what we envision our downtown can look like. Not next year, not five years from now, but hopefully how it looks 10 years or 20 years down the road. Um, you know, th this town will be here long after many of us, and that legacy that we leave behind is very important to us. That's why we have this board, in part, is we want to ensure that success. Um, we do have a few empty lots downtown. We do have some businesses in need of rehabilitation. And being able to go to our developers who are interested in those lots and present them with a plan for how we envision that downtown district in the future is important to that success. Um, it shows investment in our community. It shows investment in how we present ourselves. Um, and the way we went about it is something I think we're very proud of in that we didn't come in and try to say let's get new codes, new ordinances laid down and use force of law. We pass these as guidelines. We are hoping to you know, use a gentle hand and just encouraging people with these guidelines and these standards to make change happen slowly. Uh, we don't need to change things overnight. That's not conducive to anything. Um, and so that's what our hopes are with that. Um, this was one area where we did take a lot of community input. We had events downtown. Um, I think we had two of them, if I remember right, um, where we took community input. Again, the infrastructure committee, the hours they put in um, and the fights they had were worth every minute of it uh, and because it generated a lot of compromise. We had a lot of input and a lot of different angles on many of those uh, standards that we set out to, to write. And that document is a reflection of all of that hard work, I think. Um, and so it's something we're proud of, and it's something that we look forward to uh, encouraging people to look at, um, and you know, new business owners, people looking at construction, um, and those things moving forward. Uh, for this year, uh, of course, tonight, we are looking forward to uh, welcoming a new board member into the board. Um, we have two other new board members this year, Amy Sawyer, and uh, uh, where's... Uh, did, did she did not come? I don't know. Uh, but Heather Orson's the other one. Um, she owns Re Repurposed Boutique downtown. Uh, we are looking forward to the third person coming in, helping us round that out so we can move forward on some other, uh, other topics that we've got this year. The first big one has been the birds. Uh, not the sexiest of topics, I assure you, but um, it's one that we've been talking about at length um, and been going over, and I now know more about Everything from uh, bird birth control to hanging CDs and trees to noisemakers and everything in between. Um, this also comes back to sort of our forward-facing downtown and caring about the way it looks and, and the way people interact with it. We know that the starlings and the trees are a problem. Um, we know they can be very messy with uh, their uh, roosting, nesting in those trees. And we're trying to find a solution. Um, we have some ideas, and we hope to have something presented to you all very soon on that, a recommendation on that. Um, but it's uh, been a partnership with us. We've talked to Pitt State on it. We've been discussing things with uh, the Wildlife Commission. Larry has been great at helping us uh, communicate with some of that. 
those things uh, will hopefully build towards something that will clean up a little bit of that bird problem. Uh, that's sort of a, that's reaction to feedback from business owners who have come to us and talked to us, and uh, the need to just lift up that that problem. Uh, speaking of businesses, from 2018, uh, we had over 20 new business licenses issued in the Overlay District. Um, that's fantastic, and not only 20 of those new businesses, but businesses going into buildings that were up until that point vacant, um, people who rehabilitated buildings. Of course, everybody is well aware of Block 22 and what it's had. We're also looking forward to more new businesses still coming in July with that. Um, the restaurants will be going in there underneath the old uh, Crowell uh, drugstore um, and everything else that will be coming along with that. So we're definitely looking forward to having another big year in that aspect and more opportunities to involve folks with our board um, and what we can do there. Uh, let's see. Going along with that, oh, speaking of new businesses, and this is good for you guys, it's good for everybody out behind me, it's good for anybody listening, um, we are planning on April 18th a downtown business get-together. Information will be going out about that soon. Um, this will be for business owners to come collaborate with each other, come talk to us, we'll have some information about things we've been talking about there. The birds will be one of them, <laughs> if anybody's interested. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, traffic downtown is something that we're looking at. Um, now, I'm going to tip my hat over to uh, the ATAB more than us because they're the ones who have brought this up to us. And so we're still waiting on more information there, but we are looking at opportunities and possibilities for speeding up travel through downtown, making it safer, and increasing travel options for bicyclists and things like that. Um, there are still, I think, a lot of directions that can go, um, and we're going to be looking at some of those and how those would impact the downtown district, but um, that's something that is in our crosshairs uh, that I think has a little ways to go yet. Um, and Britain has been great working with us through the end of last year and into this year uh, with going, moving forward with trying to get some grant opportunities for downtown. The big one that we are working on right now is a historical society grant that would let us start providing survey information to business owners downtown. Uh, that's going to include you know, historical information on their buildings, you know, People who go through and find the old photos, what was in there beforehand, how were they built, things like that, and give people that historical context for the structures that are downtown because that's part of that information is why things like the downtown design standards were so important to us because we want to preserve that history. And we know uh, through some of the new businesses that have opened in the last year, year and a half, um, the showcasing they've done, whether it's on Facebook or elsewhere, Instagram, when they found like the old advertisements painted on the walls or they've peeled off sheetrock off walls and found things hidden behind them. Um, certainly what Block 22 has done to preserve the history of those buildings, that's important stuff and it gives a city identity beyond the facades. And that's something that we're excited about. Um, we'll be submitting that grant application shortly. Um, we just finished getting the letter of support written uh, in lieu of that. And part of that will also likely include expanding our board uh, uh, potentially giving us new responsibilities regarding the historical component, maybe adding a member or two to help support the historical aspect of that. That's still, I'm, I'm saying nothing about what we will do, that's just stuff that is, has been discussed as a, a possibility, uh, as well as becoming a, what is called a certified local government, um, which helps, it's just a process of saying, you know, we have these people dedicated to historical society work, um, that will take care of these things, and it gives you points towards getting other grants. Um, this grant is the first that we are looking at. Um, we are looking at a small area downtown to apply it to with the hopes of expanding that in the future based on um, what success we have, because we can't do all the buildings at once with that, obviously. Um, so yeah, uh, the only other thing that I will close with then, and I'll get out of your hair, is that if anybody wants to get involved with the Downtown Advisory Board, um, certainly let us know. Every uh, end of the year, free seats come open. Those are a mixture of downtown business owners at large positions um, and, and different, uh, different folks there to make sure we have diversity within our board for this uh, purpose. If you can't wait until then, please, by all means, let myself know, let Britton know, let somebody know. We have committees available. Um, there's no requirements on those. Those committees work for us the way we work for the commission. Um, they give us information. They do the groundwork. We have a marketing and events committee. They're the ones who are helping coordinate our uh, business get-together on April 18th right now. 
Um, they help with Small Business Saturday, things of that nature. Our infrastructure committee is the other one. They're the ones who help us talk about you know, the, the hard, fast rules of, of business, the buildings, the infrastructure, obviously. Duh. Uh, they obviously helped us with the downtown design standards and the considerations that needed to come into play there. Outside of that, if I can answer any questions for you guys or anything, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I'll get out of your hair and let you get on to more important stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That's all Thank really you. exciting. Thanks. Just a real quick thing about the Downtown Advisory Board, and obviously I attend most of the meetings of that. They, they've stepped up to, a, we brought them a lot of thorny issues, issues that aren't easy to solve, and they've been willing to take those on and have really spread out the work amongst their, 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 board, their, their subcommittees and have been very effective for us, and I think have been a real positive way that we've been able to engage and interact with the community. So I just wanted to, I wanted to put in an administrative plug for that. Great. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Moving on to item B, Sustainability Advisory Board Annual Report. Dr. James Triplett, representing the Sustainability Advisory Board, will present their annual report. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, Darren, Hank, and Tim. <laughs> Last but not least. <laughs> no, certainly not least. <laughs> Over the years, Tammy has pulled me out of the fire several times. Uh, and I really appreciate everything she does. Um, I can't talk as fast as Michael, so uh, bear with me. But um, we don't quite have a year under our belt, uh, so an annual report's a bit premature. Uh, we were formed in July at the July 10th meeting of the uh, uh, commission, and they appointed seven members. Uh, one of which is here tonight, Joel. There you are, Joel Stewart. Um, we've got a very active uh, board, but I lost my chair, because my vice chair, because uh, you snatched him up for a higher purpose <laughs> to serve on the commission, uh, that Commissioner McNally. Um, we understand that. Um, but we've got uh, a new uh, person that you appointed, uh, George Weeks. Uh, who's going to be a very active member, uh, Ashley Bachover and uh, uh, Denise Fitzpatrick are the other really active members on, on the committee right now. Um, we had um, some involvement in as early as October in the um, uh, climate and energy project that they brought down to look at solar, ran a solar workshop. We partnered with the university the city did, and that was kind of a, a, a first event. Um, Joel put together a, a, a Facebook page, which uh, yeah, which uh, extols all of our activities and virtues, and uh, we're very thankful for that, Joel. We appreciate that. Um, and our web page has all kinds of links. Um, we've hosted three webinars since uh, our uh, inception. The first one, though, was uh, on the 21st of January, and it was uh, called Reno Resilience. This is, this is a webinar put out by a group called Growing Sustainable Communities. And uh, uh, this was about sustainability in the Wild West and how Reno transformed itself from um, a heavy resource user to a more sustainable community. One of the things we learned from that was that there is a STAR program for municipalities which rates uh, in individual communities' commitment to sustainability. Kind of like the STARS program at the university for uh, out of the ASHI group. Um, our second one was uh, on uh, Baltimore's uh, acquisition of solar uh, as a big component of their uh, uh, power supply and then the third one was uh, on the value of water and uh, we have another one scheduled on the 28th of this month for uh, recycling and the, the shift in um, you know the foundation for recycling and how recycling uh, is different now mainly because of the green fence and the imperial directive out of China, um, the fact that we aren't shipping 
a lot of our materials over there. So we're, we have invited people from the university and from uh, the recycling center to participate in that webinar because it's going to be pretty important. So I think hosting webinars is certainly one of the big things that the city sustainability can do. And we appreciate Jay's um, getting it all together and making the computer sing for us when, <laughs> when some of us are a little challenged. Um, we did have an interesting report from Dr. Christine Brodsky and her student, uh, Caitlin Densing, uh, on uh, urban wildlife. Uh, Caitlin had a, 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 an internship last summer, and she worked up a thing on uh, urban wildlife, which hopefully we're going to have ready to go uh, for Earth Day. Um, one of our uh, members, Denise Fitzpatrick, has taken a lead role in getting things together for our Earth Day celebration. We're not sure if this is the first ever, but it's certainly the first in a long time that the community has come together to celebrate uh, Earth Day. And so um, we're hoping to attract a lot of uh, folks from around the community to participate in this celebration. Uh, it's going to be on the 20th of uh, April, which is um, the actual Earth Day is the 22nd, the Monday, but uh, we thought the Saturday of the 20th would be a lot better to use the pavilion and attract people who are in town for uh, sports activities and other, and it, you know, it's, it's also the day before Easter, so we should have uh, a lot of families available. Um, we do have a, um, a sign-up sheet or a, a solicitation for booze out. Thanks to Sarah Runyon, who's been just amazing in putting together our flyers and, and, and putting together the sign-up uh, and getting that on, on our website. Um, she's been a huge help in, in putting this together. And, uh, Denise couldn't be here because she's traveling right now, but we've got so much work for her to do when she comes back. <laughs> <laughs> we've been meeting in spite of her being absent and putting things together. Uh, Joel's been very active, uh, and so have the other uh, committee members. So we're, we're looking forward to a gala celebration on the 20th of, uh, of April for Earth Day. And I think that's probably about all I have to share. I'd answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds Once again, this like is our, you're busy. This is our newest board, our newest, our newest professional board of the city, and Good. they've yeah. been, they've really kind of at first kind of struggled a little bit with their role and what they're doing, but I think they've got some some wind under their wings now. And uh, Earth Day is their big their big event this year, so it'll be fun. Good. I'm a child of the '60s. Earth Day was a big deal for me. So <laughs> come come on come on come on uh, yeah. April 20th. So. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. thank you, thank you. Now we move on to uh, consider the following. Uh, because this is a special uh, meeting, uh, we did not have uh, public input uh, listed on this agenda. Uh, and in consideration of, uh, of openness, we have uh, decided to uh, allow anyone who wants to speak to these items to come forward after I read through them and uh, give their uh, comments. And we ask that you limit it to five minutes, please. And with that, we move on to Silverback Landing Road. Consider the recommendation of the Economic Development Advisory Committee to provide $60,000 from the revolving loan fund, which when combined with a similar amount from the street sales tax, will enable the city to construct concrete roads in the Silverback Landing. Approve or disapprove recommendation of the Economic Development Advisory Board. With this, I'll uh, open up the uh, input if someone wants to come and speak before any of this. And again, I ask that you hold your comments to five minutes. My name is Sharon Strength. I live at 1515 Hampton. Um, just to review some of the facts that we're all familiar with, in 2018, the city gave Silverback Landing $15,000 in a forgivable loan. On August the 8th, Silverback Landing received a $1,950,000 loan from Arvis Bank for a $2,400,000 project. 
On August the 14th, the commission approved a $450,000 loan. On November the 13th, the commission approved to modify the loan for the proceeds to be used for pre-construction expenses and fixed infrastructure. The city is building a concrete road from Centennial to the property line of Silverback Landing at a cost of $1,250,000. The roads in Silverback Landing were planned as concrete roads. All surrounding neighborhoods are paved with concrete. This should be no different. It only makes sense to pave it with concrete to last 20 years. The street sales tax, Ordinance S-1048, was approved by citizens to pay for the maintenance and repair of city streets. Silverback Landing does not meet the criteria of the street tax resolution. Therefore, the commission should not approve this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mayor See Commissioners, yes. Matt has the flu, so okay. he didn't just dodge the meeting, I promise. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, this is a this is not the the concrete road that we are building. This would be the interior roads on the development phase one. Um, these would all become city roads after the fact once they're uh, completed as part of the um, normal process of of construction. In the uh, all the roads in the city become ours eventually, unless they're on a private drive or private property. So um, yeah, Matt's crew recommended um, in order to avoid what we know is going to happen with a, an asphalt road most we have we have a lot of familiarity with with asphalt roads most of our roads in town are asphalt most of them actually are a couple inches of asphalt over brick which makes them uh, even harder to maintain but in this case with the amount of construction um, if i could take you back this development is just south of a neighborhood and in order to alleviate the numerous traffic issues that would have been created by building a um, hundred in this case 60 houses in phase one and then eventually hundred I believe 60 houses over all three phases and taking all of that construction equipment through that existing neighborhood the council made the uh, decision to build a road up from the south which is what we did that roads completed um, it was built out of concrete for for the similar purpose to be able to handle all the construction that's going to take place on it so we don't have to repair <coughs> Um, any sooner than we would normally have to repair it. In this case, as Matt's group looked at it, um, one thing they're, they, they're very good at doing is comparing bid sheets once they get prices from the contractor. Or once the contractor's been chosen and they get the prices, they can go through and, and start picking it apart and seeing where uh, they could save money. This is something that um, seemed like a, an easy recommendation for them to make. It's $120,000 now. It's all in the memo. Um, we'd probably spend, his estimate was $200,000 in five years. To, and, and that's uh, with normal wear and tear. I'm assuming it be, um, could possibly be even worse than that. Um, we're just trying to avoid doing it later. Um, uh, as you can tell right now, we've had a very harsh winter. We currently have two sales taxes for road improvements. Um, I just got back from DC. I just got back from Kansas City. I spent a lot of time in Topeka. We are no different than anybody else. This was a very brutal winter on roads, and we are not an exception. So uh, the maintenance of, of our roads is, is critical, and anything I think we can do to defer um, to make good decisions now that would allow us to save money later um, is a good idea. I, I completely support Mass recommendation. I think it's a good idea. Um, these will become city streets. These are not private streets. These are going to become city streets, and I think it would uh, make sense for us to do whatever we can now to um, avoid what we know is going to happen in 5 and then 10 and then 15 years, which is spending up to a quarter of a million dollars to repave them. So that's the recommendation. Matt, apologize for not being here, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. I have a question. She, uh, this is Strength, in her... Public input said that the Silverback Landing development was planned for concrete roads and not asphalt. Was, was that part of the planning for them to be concrete to begin with? Planned by the developer? Yeah. I don't know what the developer planned. Um, the roads we have are asphalt. They, all of our interior roads are asphalt. We went through the same thing with Tractor Supply. When they put in a road in, it was 
Uh, we questioned how wide it was and what it was made of, and we negotiated to have it wider, and we paid for the width. So um, the plan to have it be concrete, um, the roads we were presented were asphalt, and the, the, the question for, from Matt's group was to upgrade them to concrete. So I have another question have an concerning that. that, then. The, what is it called, a RID? Uh, RHID? Yeah. And in that, uh, the developer, I take it, paid for the initial cost of infrastructure. That includes uh, storm sewers, uh, sidewalks, streets, water lines, gas lines, electric. And through this puppy tax, the cost that he pays for this will be reimbursed, I take it, through the property tax for 15 years from the city, the county, and the school system. So my question is, if he's going to get paid for the uh, streets, whether they be out of asphalt or concrete, wouldn't he be paid back for that, putting in concrete streets to yes. begin with? If he put in concrete streets, he would. So that's my question, then where are we at with that? Well, he's, so not, you're gonna put, he's not required to put in concrete streets. He's required to put in asphalt streets. So if he put in concrete streets, um, although he'd be reimbursed, he would be spending an extra $121,000 to do it. So. so in the original plan, he had planned for asphalt, you're telling me, not concrete. Yeah, I, I have, plan. that's so, my understanding. So when we talk about original plan, what we really need to talk about is the plan that was presented to us when it was when we voted on it, and that was asphalt. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I, we, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go. No, you girls first. <laughs> go ahead. Can you speak to um, the comment about the ordinance? That yeah, this these, doesn't fall the ordinance is to maintain city streets, and these will become city streets, and. They will become city streets um, when they're completed, not in five years. In five years, they will be city streets that we've owned for four and a half years. So, yeah, I think it, it, um, it's very clear in the ordinance that that tax is to take care of our streets, and these will be our streets. Well, it does yeah. seem to make sense to uh, spend the extra money to put in concrete as opposed to asphalt and have to keep redoing it uh, uh, year after year. And Mayor, I just point out that on the agenda tonight, the only, the only item is the sixty thousand dollars from the economic right. development committee. Any other comments? comments? <clears throat> and this is something a recommendation that if we were constructing any new road around the city um, for maintenance purposes, we would recommend that it be concrete. Correct. I try to get every road um, constructed out of concrete. Obviously, the, the developers. Um, it's in their best interest to, you know, build within their budget, and uh, the requirement is not for concrete streets. Our, I believe Cameron's here, but I believe our our spec is <coughs> is a paved street. So um, obviously that's why they usually come in with as with asphalt. And in this case, I think with the construction, Matt Matt's group makes a great point. It, it knowing what we know, um, it's it's all, I mean I wouldn't say it's a no brainer, but it's very simple to do it in concrete and protect. Are having to go right back in and, and, and finish it out. But Cameron, please add anything. Yeah. Uh, our subdivision uh, specs uh, allow for asphalt as well as concrete streets. So to, there's initial up cost, upfront cost is a little bit more expensive for the concrete versus the asphalt. But uh, we do get a much longer life out of it and much more durable pavement. Again, this is an area that'll be under a lot of construction traffic, which is uh, usually uh, some of the worst type of loads that you can put on the street. This will uh, prevent us from having to go in and, like I say, within the next five to 15 years, go in and do one, if not multiple, mill and overlays on there at the cost exceeding that 120000 that's being looked at now. Did we contact Mr. Venna about this concern, and was he receptive to maybe putting in concrete instead of asphalt? Or what was his thoughts on that? Uh, contacting whom? Mr. Venna, the developer of the property. Well, as you can see, uh, what's before you is an outcome of those conversations with them. So you he know, it, wasn't in favor of putting in concrete. That's I think it was a budget issue that he uh, uh, 
had the problem with. Okay. In in the old days, when uh, the price between asphalt and concrete was far apart, we used to put in a lot of asphalt. But now that the prices have come closer together, we generally opt for this uh, um, material because it does stay better. Well, right. and you have to keep in mind, uh, to Commissioner Munsell's point, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions with uh, Mickey and we've had a lot of discussions with the people that develop um, Tractor Supply and that are doing North Walnut. Uh, and, you know, de developers are individuals with their own preferences. And if you talk to Mickey, um, Mickey builds up in Johnson County. They actually make the case that the asphalt road is a superior road to concrete because of the way you can tear the whole top off and, and redo the surface as opposed to having to just do pieces and blocks. Um, personally, our staff doesn't agree with it. I mean, we think in this case it's, it's concrete's the preferred way to go. But... Um, the idea that anybody up here is, is speaking for Mickey or, or, or saying that, that Mickey thinks that uh, concrete's a superior product, quite frankly, I'd say the, the, ad, the adverse is true. And my discussions were with him that he thought asphalt was a superior product and he thought it was a lot easier for the city to maintain that road later because we could continuously put a nice, um, even, consistent surface across the whole thing. But our, our experience is just that um, it seems like it makes it an issue in five years instead of 15 and uh so we negotiated on that on that on, on you know matt's pretty good at this matt's mm. from around here um matt's in charge of the roads and, and uh matt's pretty clear that if we can get okay. concrete on this thing can we get it and so i agree um, with everything you've said darren but my point is i would have hoped that mickey would have uh wanted concrete if that was our wishes so I, in my opinion i think maybe he should have been responsible for it but i i agree i think uh the asphalt is more of an issue for us down the line i would have liked to see mickey uh go ahead and and change his point to from asphalt to concrete so i i think in my opinion that's that should have been his cost so. i'm not trying to defend mickey at all i don't know the gentleman but he was responsive to the all of the discussion last year on stormwater. So exactly, there's a lot of things that came up on that development, and we had spirited conversation on it, and we got to where we're at now. And uh, so, yeah, I think he's been responsive. And I think that as much as he can. Um, Do we have any I other? I can't uh, imagine a scenario where he would want to spend another one hundred twenty-one thousand dollars out of his own pocket to give us the kind of. I mean, he's required to put in a road. And that's where it ends. I don't know a lot of developers that are going above and beyond what's required. Okay. Do we have any other comments from the commission? Do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Resolution number 1219. Consider adopting resolution number 1219. Determining the intent of the City of Pittsburgh, Kansas to issue its industrial revenue bonds in the aggregate amount not to exceed $3,180,000 to finance the cost of acquiring, constructing, and equipping a commercial project for the benefit of Northgate Associates, LLC, or its successors, and assigns Northgate Plaza project sales tax exemption only. Approve or disapprove the resolution? We'll see if Blake comes to the mic. If not, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this would support the uh, the Northgate CID project that the, the commission approved a couple of meetings ago. Um, always want to reassure our residents that with an industrial revenue bond, it does not create any financial liability for the city. The main reason a developer would ask for this is so that they can get the sales tax exemption on the construction materials, but no financial liability at all for the city. But I'd be happy to answer any specific questions that you may have. I had a question reading Sir. through this. Uh, what happens if uh, in the 22 years this uh, tax is, is, or maybe I'm, my tax is on down later, but anyway, you can answer it. What happens in 22 years if that tax does not pay off this $3 million plus? It ends. 
that that would just be the developer's loss if it doesn't equal the the amount of investment. Okay. Blake, do you know why they decided to go this route and add the bonds in, or maybe they could speak for why they added well, because the bonds it would, here? It, it would garner then the sales tax exemption on the construction materials. Okay. Okay. And typically offers a property tax exemption, but they're not requesting that. But they didn't know that before. Pardon me? They didn't know that before. Okay. I'm just asking why this is new, why this has been added. Well, it was actually part of the, the action that the commission considered three weeks ago. When we, when we brought the CID uh, proposal to you, uh, we, we mentioned at that time that they would be requesting an industrial revenue bond for the sales tax exemption on the construction materials, but it would not have the property tax exemption along with okay. it that okay. typically IRBs do. Okay, thank you. Blake, I think there was some confusion, some, uh, some people on the total cost of that project. Some of them thought it was only a $3 million, $3,180,000 contract, and that's paid by the uh, increase in uh, sales tax in yes, that sir. district. But the total cost... Overall, it's an estimated $8 million project. And that IRB bond uh, are not any responsibility of this city. No, that's sir. all on... Not at all. And, and the only reason, um, and Henry can correct me if I'm wrong, the only reason that it, it comes before the city is because it has that sales tax exemption and the way the statute is set up. Uh, they want to give cities and, and municipalities the opportunity to approve or disapprove of that because it does have the sales tax exemption. But no, the developer goes out and gets the bond. Uh, the city's not liable for any of it at all. Uh, reading through this, uh, I, 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 I keep seeing them talk about the uh, northern pad sites and the southern pad sites. What does that mean? Northern be Payless? Payless, right. So it's... it's the, east the, the former Payless shoot okay. location. Okay, yes. okay. And with the south, the Applebee's? Yes, okay. Sir. South is Applebee's. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other comments or concerns? If there are none, I'll make a motion to approve. I second been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Ordinance number S-1016. Consider adopting ordinance numbers S-1016, authorizing the creation of the Northgate Plaza Community Improvement District in the city of Pittsburgh, Kansas, authorizing the making of certain project improvements relating thereto approving the estimated cost of such project improvements, levying a community improvement district sales tax within such district, and providing for the method of financing <clears throat> the same and approving a development agreement. So, Mr. Mayor, this would authorize uh, the 0.9% additional sales tax uh, that was approved by the commission on just the uh, just the retailers in the Northgate shopping complex that would, as, as Commissioner Munsell mentioned, uh, it would reimburse the developer for uh, the planned improvements they intend to make. Uh, what, what's especially advantageous about this for the city is the developer fronts the cost and then the city reimburses them. So once again, there is no fi financial liability of the city funding these and the developer paying for them as they go. Uh, the developer is reimbursed as they go. But this is the resolution that would officially authorize that additional sales tax to be collected on the Northgate shopping complex. And all of the people who uh, do business in that area vote to approve this? They were contacted and gave their approval. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was a big, that was a big uh, factor in the EDAC uh, when they considered this was the fact that the, the developers had been intentional and had gone and visited with all the retailers first and gotten their approval. Cool. <clears throat> is the project um, schedule still valid? Is you still? <coughs> Any other questions or concerns? Just one comment since uh, it's developer day. Uh, the, the, the gentlemen that are in the front row, um, they recently purchased the property. If you're familiar with Pittsburgh at all, there's been a lot going on on the north side of town. There's a lot in the south. This is kind of um, right in the middle. It's the old, I think it's the old Walmart um, location, mm -hmm. if not the actual building. Um, they took a chance on Pittsburgh. We don't have a lot of new developers to our community. Um, we have negotiated with them 
and we, we're still standing. They're, they're a pretty good bunch. Um, they do have a, a project schedule as part of the development agreement, so this, they, th this will happen in a timely fashion. Um, we only pay after the fact, and we only pay with money that's been collected, so uh, I just wanted to acknowledge them, appreciate them um, picking Pittsburgh as a place to invest, and uh, appreciate the way that they've negotiated with us. I think this is the first time we've done a CID. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had the policy for a couple of years, but I, I think it's a great example of something that is going to happen over there that's going to improve the shopping experience for the people, and it, and it wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have had that CID policy. So thanks, guys, and thank uh, you, thanks, Commissioner, for letting thank us work through this. I also, uh, on page 16, appreciate that if um, there's any change in tenants, either opening or closing, to let the city know within 30 days. I think that's good. Great point. to have. No further comment. I look for an approval. Motion. Make a motion to approve. Thanks, Blake. I second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Duncan and Allen, engagement letter for legal services. Consider in entering into an engagement letter for legal services with Duncan and Allen. Okay. Mayor Trish, Mayor Hi. Um, the um, when the last time we had, had a formal issue of, related to uh, municipal electric utility uh, was when uh, 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 Jerry Warren was up here and he pre presented his feasibility study, which indicated that we, we it would be it would make sense to, to move forward with further considerations of it. Um, at that time, the, the we you know we, they, they, the commission asked what what our next step was. Uh, we said, well, the next step was really to, to meet with, with, with Evergy to, to really see where they stood and what, what it was going to look like. We have, uh, have had that meeting. They, are, uh, they indicated that they were uh, ready to meet with us, um, and they planned on uh, something probably early April. Uh, and at that time, they were going to be bringing their, their legal staff, their regulatory staff, their engineers. Um, and uh, we felt that um, it was really time for us to, to assemble our team. Um, we, I mean, you know, being at the table with an entire staff from Evergy, without with just Darren and I, even even with Dr. Bailey behind, we still felt a little uncomfortable. We we needed this. We we've, we've talked about uh, putting assembling a team that could see see through this negotiation and this uh, this effort that is really outside of our, of our expertise. And uh, one of the main elements of this is is legal representation. And, uh, and we've we looked at numerous, uh, there, well, not numerous. There aren't that many uh, firms that are familiar with this this type type of work. Uh, we did we, we we interviewed four different different firms, and um, and and Duncan and Allen is, uh, was chosen as our as the preferred one. They do have a local presence. Somebody uh, well, relatively local. They're out of they they uh, live in Oakland Park, so it, uh, they're able to come down here much more easily than the other the others who are on the east coast. So, and they're equally qualified and have done considerable representation before the Kansas Corporation Commission, which is going to be required as this process moves on. The, this particular engagement letter strikes a, 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 a <coughs> per hour fee, um, and, and that's, that's the, and, and the scope of work that we anticipate arising from it. That's, that's I'd like to make a motion that we, uh, for a referendum, uh, before we proceed any further with the possibility of creating an electric utility, and I, I would happily give my reasons for this. Referendum. I don't get that. I don't understand what you're saying. A referendum is a uh, is a vote of the citizens oh, to of take the community to uh, whether they want <clears throat> to proceed with this. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'd be happy to give you my reasons why I brought this up at this time. And my reasons are I was part of the initial process and we had a gentleman, well, we had several presentations uh, from co-ops that could sell us electricity. Uh, but we had a gentleman, gentleman from Winter Park, Florida that did the initial presentation and it was all positive that we needed to do this. And my first question was, uh, what was the last city in Kansas that had done what we wanted to possibly consider doing? And he told me that 
there would be nobody around that we could get that information from because the last city in Kansas that did this was in the 1900s. Uh, so we proceeded past that point. Like I said, we've had several meetings. Uh, there was great attendance at the first meetings, first couple meetings, and then the attendance fell off. And that was explained that the reason why that happened was because of the time of year, Christmas season, and uh, people got busy. And these were business owners in the city of Pittsburgh that we presented this to. So one of the per people that was in this, these meetings questioned why weren't they there, because this is valuable information. And it was given that they were busy. But I'm thinking if this is really something that we need to proceed with, these business owners might have had somebody there to listen to what was being said. And I know Jay said he would take notes and send emails to what was happening. As we proceeded in the meetings, I got information. And it, it was just, you know, for me as a commissioner, before I want to make a decision on something, I want to hear all sides. And I know the city has a side. Westar has a side. Businesses have an opinion, and so do citizens. But anyway, getting back to my point, uh, it was pointed out uh, that Winter Park, Florida was picked to do this because no one else does it or hasn't done it in Kansas, so we found Winter Park, Florida. I asked a gentleman at the time, there was a city in Florida also, Vero Beach, Florida, that went completely the opposite direction. They were, the city had owned their electric, electric municipality, and for whatever reasons, they sold it back to Florida Power and Light. I asked the gentleman if he had any knowledge of that, and he had none. But, you know, like I said, that, to me, to make a decision, I understand what the city's point is, but I, I, I just don't know if the city reached out and try to get a hold of Barrel Beach, try to get a hold of other cities that own their own municipality, and for whatever reason, they had decided to sell it back to the power company and what the reasons were. I thought that had been very, very valuable information for us to see what their issues was. Maybe we would experience the same issues they had and the reason for going back. I never heard anything uh, other than that from Barrow Beach, so I got on the uh, computer and looked up on the internet what the reasons was. In so doing, I found out not here recently, there's another city, uh, Georgetown, Texas, same, same situation. They owned the uh, electric municipality, and I'm not going to go through all the reasons they gave either one of these cities. Anybody out there can look up the same information I got and find out why why this wasn't such a good idea for those cities. And I would have liked to have that information presented to us so we could weigh what is the best thing for us to do at the time. It wasn't. I looked it up on my own. Now, I know we went around to different organizations and talked to them about the possibility of creating our own municipality. I asked every time I had the opportunity if the citizens will have an opportunity to vote on whether they want to do this or not. I was very concerned at the last meeting we had from on this Mr. Warren when he presented his study. I asked again if the citizens will have the opportunity to vote on this. And Henry said depending on how it's funded, they might not get the opportunity to vote on this. And, and that kind of upsets me because I know in some of the meetings the city of Wichita started the process. They spent $100,000 for their feasibility study, if I remember correctly. But it, after they spent that kind of money, it was explained that a political climate changed. And I didn't go into detail what that meant. I took it that maybe when the city decided to do this, and the commissioners at the time was in favor of this, and spent the money for the study, then the next election, the citizens voted for people that wasn't in favor of this, and that's where it stopped. 
So my point is tonight asking for a referendum for the citizens because I've had numerous citizens call me almost constantly talking to me about their concerns with this. Why are they not going to get an opportunity to vote on this? And I said, I don't know that you're not. Like I said, I was concerned with Mr. McGinney saying that uh, depend on how we fund it, they might not get the opportunity. And for me, as a commissioner, this is too much for five commissioners to put on, to be put on us. The possible debt that this would put the city uh, on the city. Can I ask you a question? When you're talking about the debt now, are you talking about the proposals in front of us or the potential debt to, to do a municipality? I, well, I would like to know the answers to that, what it could possibly be. Okay. And, you know, I don't know if anybody knows me, but I don't vote for something if I don't know what it's going to cost the taxpayers. And uh, I have no idea what it's going to cost. And you kind of got me off my train of thought, Don. I'm but sorry, but no, I that's, just that's want to clear it. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> but, no, I, I don't think five commissioners should have this put upon them because we're just temporary. We're temporary for two years or four years. And, you know, I think if... if us in a temporary position puts all this vote upon ourselves and then you know where does it go from there I, I, the citizens on an issue like this with the potential debt that it could put the city under for a number of years should be given to the citizens Is it, if, and I'm not saying that I'm against this or I'm for it all I'm saying is this ought to be Done by referendum. referendum. So that's, you're that's, you're proposing that even before we uh, engage the appropriate consultants, that we take it to the voters. I would. I think they need to know what this. Is. You know, we spent. But well, we don't know. What we don't. I know. don't. We don't know. We don't so know what it's going how, to cost. How would we do that? Well, more importantly, what would you be voting on? Yeah. Because the whole point of the contracts before you today is to sit down and have a logical discussion with Evergy about if this is possible, how it would work, what the price would be, how it would be stood up, how it would be powered. And so there, there's a variations on every one of those things, and we can't speak for Evergy. We haven't even started the discussion with Evergy. Um, so that's what these contracts are. So when we sit down with Evergy in a couple of weeks, we actually have an attorney that can talk to their attorney about the things that attorneys need to talk about with regards to making this transition, if, so, if that's how we go. I, I definitely think there will be a, a time to take this to the voters, but you'll, we'll take this to the voters when you decide that you have a product that is sustainable, that makes sense, that's affordable, and that works for this community. And we are months if not years from getting into that level of detail um, with with Evergy it's their asset and we need to have those discussions but we need to have those discussions with a team that is capable of having those in a timely manner that doesn't waste Evergy's time and definitely doesn't waste our time so um, I understand everything you're saying and and I agree with most of it but there is a timing to doing this and to have a a, a vote on something that we don't even know what it is. Um, it's not that it's it's not the right time. It it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, the only thing that to, you could be to vote we on. would be voting on is whether to proceed with this study. Uh, and to me, that's not that doesn't have enough uh, weight. We can vote to proceed with the study, and when we finally get down to the uh, to our end discussion, then we'll take it further. But well, until that time, we really don't have uh, the correct information uh, to give our voters. We, I mean, all, all you're going to be uh, putting before them is hearsay and conjecture. Fear. And fear. Uh, you're not really going to have anything valid, thought out, and legitimate to give to them yet. And when we do, then I think that's the time that this discussion comes about. 
further, I, reading through all of these uh, things that we're going to be voting on, I uh, it really points up the fact that we need this level of expertise to guide us as we proceed in this process to see if we want to finally do this job. Well, And we've got some good people here, evidently, uh, that are uh, recommended uh, that uh, will help us uh, guide this through. And going back to your first point, Chuck, that it hasn't been done in however many years. So what? Exactly. So what? <laughs> exactly. But my other point was, Patrick, that there are cities that have done this, and for whatever reason they've made the decision they don't want to do it anymore. That's all I wanted, the information, and I think that could have been discussed in the meetings we had, what their reasoning was that they decided they didn't do it. And for tonight, if I may, all I asked for was a referendum to put to the citizens to be able to vote on this. Darren says they will be. Why I brought this up because of the comments from our city attorney, depending on how this would be funded, it might not go to the vote of the citizens. That was my concern. Why, you know, I wanted to make sure that before we spend the kind of money this might cost, that the citizens will be the ones uh, voting on this, and that's why I brought it up tonight, but evidently Darren agrees that the to citizens... To be clear, do what? to be clear, yeah, go what ahead. the city attorney said was um, it it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be, depending on the funding, mm -hmm. and what I said is this body, whether it's you or another version in two years, whenever we get around to doing this, will make that decision. Um, there's, I mean, you're, a, you're asking for answers to questions that can't possibly be answered right now. We may not even make it that far. Approving these two contracts isn't a promise of anything except that we will take an intelligent approach to a very important project. That's all it is. You want to get 24 months down the line and have answers about what's going to be voted on, how it's going to be voted on, none of that information is available. There is no way anybody in this room can have any idea the answers to those questions, Commissioner. Okay. That is why this is extremely important. That's why we've taken a very <clears throat> pragmatic approach to this point. We've brought everybody along all the way, whether you approved with the attendance at the stakeholders groups, those were the stakeholders, and they were met for six months. And we did what they asked, and we followed their lead, and we brought them along. And we are to this process today with the same understanding that nothing has been decided, but we definitely think this is something that's important enough and makes sense and is being done in Kansas. Um, there are three communities that are very similar to our size that currently run their own electric utility, and there's 115 other ones. Um, this is not a new concept. So the fact that there's a, company, there's, there's, a, there's a community in Texas that may or, not be happy, may or may not be happy with their electric utility um, this is a very individualistic, a very isolated thing. For the, the, the city of Pittsburgh is a very, very small part of a huge client base for a new company called Evergy. And not only are we very small, we're half of 1% of their customers, but we are geographically on the very, very outskirts of their territory. So um, our initial conversations with Evergy were, quite frankly, about we are unique, and we do think we have uh, some unique considerations, and would they be willing to talk to us? And that's how we ended the last commission meeting. I said, we're going to take a breath, and we're going to go back and talk to them. Um, we did. They recommended they would come to town with their team and have these important discussions about operation, about a possible purchase, about the regulatory process. And that is why what you have before you today is our counterparts, so we can have an intelligent conversation quickly and move through this to some resolution, whether it's, hey, this isn't going to work for us, or, you know, this is probably something we need to consider. And at that point, I have not heard anything from staff or any of the commissioners about, we just absolutely won't take this to the vote of the people. I, I never mean, this probably that. should go to, well, I if I can it. finish, I'm just, I'm not saying you didn't say it, I'm just explaining what happened so we can get through this. 
um, that will always be something that we will consider. But this is a this is a very early step in that, and the commitment here. Um, you brought up a great point. I've I've had it asked before. What's the cost of this initiative? Um, you know, I think one thing the staff's pretty good at identifying costs and telling you guys, hey, we want to build a bridge. It costs this, and here's how we're going to pay for it. This isn't like that. Um, this can go several ways. If we if we go meet with Evergy, and we have a positive negotiation. Um, over a couple of years, we could spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars working out the details. Um, if, we, if we go to them and, and we don't have a positive meeting and we decide that we want to continue forward, we have statutorily, um, we have the power, our franchise is up, we can move forward in another direction. That's going to be more costly. So what we did, as Jay referred to, we negotiated an hourly price by a bunch of competing firms that are all well known. Some of them are for attorney services. Um, some of them are for the regulatory piece, and some of them are financial experts, and we think we have some very good contracts. Um, we think we have a, a pretty friendly partner right now in Evergy. Our conversations have been positive, and, and we think it's time to go after this, and that's, that's all that is on the table today. Yeah, okay, I, I understand what you're saying, but Thanks. then I have a question to you. Sure. If there are cities, for whatever reason, that went this this route and they decided they didn't would you not want to know some of the reasons that uh, maybe it wasn't a good idea or am i just don't need that you know what i'm saying we had a feasibility study that was done to see if this was feasible for the city of pittsburgh if there were negatives to that that would have been presented correct me if i'm wrong in that presentation right it came out positive because overall it is a positive thing. If it had been overall a negative thing or if there had been negatives to it, that would have been part of that presentation. That was a feasibility study for this community, not another one, not in Texas, not in Florida, not in anywhere else. We heard that this is a good thing for our community. If it hadn't been, we would have heard that instead. So let me ask you this, Commissioner. Ms. Commissioner, if we were on our own utility and it didn't work out for us, we would hire somebody to do a study that uh, would say this is not a good thing uh, for the city of Pittsburgh. We need to sell it back to the, uh, the power supplier. And I understand how studies work, and I know that the person that we hired to do it had done it before, and that's all it was to present on how this would work for the city. He wasn't there to show any other things. So what I'm saying is whether we went with his or if we were our own municipality, and we decided not to do it, we would hire somebody that's in that field that would show us why this is not a good idea and why do we need to sell it back to the city. And on that, that's the end of my comments, and uh, thank you for your time. How would we be uh, updated on the progress of, this, of these negotiations? And, I mean, is there a way that we can engage the public in, kind of, and keep them um, some input and... The, um, discussion about where this is going so the, the we're fully lead, transparent the lead, the lead in the uh, very good question the lead in the negotiation will be the will be the attorney will be duncan and allen all right and uh they are required they're going to bill us all right monthly and they're required as part of that billing to provide us a report that gives us an ask that gives us an update on the progress that's, that's taking place and how you know we'll keep track of how much money is being spent all along uh we would we could easily provide monthly updates to to where this is where this, where this and, and, and to your point, you know, some of those negotiations are proprietary information, so I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the level of detail that we would be able to provide to the community or even, you know, would be. Well, that's a great point, but at the same time, we'll tell you whatever you, want, you ask us. I mean, if you guys want an update at every commission meeting, the last five minutes we do non-agendas, <clears throat> we can tell you what you know. Um, it, it's completely... Whatever you want. I mean, as far as the citizens go, I definitely think there are going to be milestones in this where we'll kind of have some no go, no some go no goes. As far as you know, quite frankly, if we get back and the price is just so gigantic that I mean, as soon as we know that and, and it's too big, I mean, we know what we can afford, we'll be done. 
So, so we can just walk away. So we have walk away points in these contracts at any time without any notice, really. I mean, was it maybe a, a month? Days. And days. then, uh, okay. and we also are in the position where we're approving the engagement of our attorneys. So they're not just out doing what they want for two weeks and sending us bills. Mm -hmm. They're they're setting up meetings, and we are authorizing that work as we go. So we have a lot of control over it. But yeah, the reporting will be to the level that we can, um, whatever you guys desire. And all of these contracts. <clears throat> have uh, <coughs> points where they have to get back to us and keep us apprised of what's going on. And then it's up to us how we want to disseminate that. Correct. And, and, and every step of the way, we will learn more and more. We will be incurring some costs along the way, which will update you on those costs. And then we'll be learning more and more as we go along. And, and, and there's points all along there to, to say if we're going to proceed or not. Any other comments from the commission? There are no others. I move to approve. I second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. It's been passed. Move on to GE Warren Associates Master Services Agreement. Consider entering into a master service agreement with GE Warren Associates. Yes, sir. I uh, again, this is the uh, a second contract to, or to to help make up a team that we can use when we're meeting with Evergy. Uh, G. Warren Associates is the company with Jerry Warren being the principal who provided the uh, feasibility study. Um, in this, in his role going forward, uh, this contract uh, makes Jerry a client representative. He's not going to be an engineer that's making engineering decisions for us necessarily but he will be working with us to review the work products of the other team members, right? making sure that what the progress is in our best interest. Right? Uh, again, having been through the process before, we feel we need somebody with expertise to, to guide us, to at least give us a sense that this is the right, this is this, this uh, to kind of interpret the work, the, the results of the work products that, that the other uh, team members are creating, as well as to give us some insights into the negotiation process with the average. Jay, I noticed on page 123, uh, item 4-4, four uh, it's talking about outstanding bills that the city owes. It says uh, uh, they're outstanding if they're uh, 120 days, or in parentheses it says 60 days. Oops. 60 was... In, 60 is the correct was one? Okay. It was a type graph letter. It says 60. Okay. And I noticed that we have some responsibilities in this. Uh, we're, we're appointing a project manager, a mm -hmm. uh, small committee, and a project executive. So we have our hands in this uh, issue. We have to. Um, at their, Jay has at to, their request. I, told him to. I mean, if we don't control that part of it in house, then, the, then what I was talking about with approving hours and knowing how we are in budget. You know, we don't want to get in a situation where, you know, somebody can look them back and say, hey, we, we billed you 80 hours. We thought you wanted us to do that. And we're like, well, we weren't even going that direction. Yeah. So Jay is going to have to manage this. Um, the good thing is Jay has a lot of project management experience in his past life. And uh, and uh, I think he'll be downright ornery. But I think it's, it's, it has to be in-house for that. We can't contract for that. Okay. Any other questions regarding this item? Hearing none, I move. I uh, look for a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 No. Opposed. Aye. It's been it's been uh, approved. We move on to item F: appointment of downtown advisory board. Due to due to the resignation of a downtown advisory board member, the appointment of a new member to fill the role of property owner hospitality industry or downtown resident is needed for the term beginning immediately and concluding on December the 31st, 2020. And we... It's time to vote. There he yes. Is. Go ahead. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, like, I, like you said, there was a resignation on the board, so we put out the applications. We received two eligible applications due to the industries that were required. Um, I believe both applicants are present to give you a brief introduction of themselves. Um, if you're prepared for that, sure. I will turn sure. that over to whoever's ready. Sorry. Brief. Hello, everyone. Um, 
As you may have seen from my application, um, I'm currently in my last week at Pittsburgh State University. So, um, oh, and I'm Sydney and Selmy for the general public watching out there. So they all know me. We've worked in economic development together, which has been a complete joy and a wonderful experience for me. But um, over the last year, my husband and I have decided to dip our feet into entrepreneurship. Um, as Brad said it in the back, I've jumped off the cliff. Uh, so I'm in my last week. Um, my husband and I co-own Creative 124, which is a video services company. He's located in Block 22, um, and that is, he does everything from weddings to corporate videos and, and other hospitality events, and I am in the process of purchasing Audacious Boutique in downtown Pittsburgh and um, transitioning into ownership there. So uh, I thought, you know, what better way to spend my new time than to join a city board? So I've been part of the downtown marketing committee for the last four years. Um, I've been involved and in, in spearheaded the small business Saturday events that we've held the last three years that have all been very successful. And I really see this as an opportunity for me to engage deeper in the city um, and pursue these entrepreneurial endeavors. So I'd love the chance to serve as a full board member, um, but if not, I'll still continue to serve on committees. Unfortunately, I have to run. We're in the middle of TEDx rehearsals for TEDx Pittsburgh State University. Um, they're going on right now. So if you know me, I'm in a million places at once all the time. So I'm going to have to run out. But we do have tickets available. Dick Horton, Jeremy Johnson, and, and uh, Shawnee Lorenz here are all um, speaking. And so I encourage you. They, they're doing phenomenal um, presentations and good friends of the city. So that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Thanks. Thank you. Ruth Allen? I'm Ruth Ellen Simpson. I have owned a property at 7th and Broadway since 1980. Oh, God, Sarah's born 88. And I'm um, still at that corner and continue to do business there and take care of a really old building. I sent my application in, and actually, rather than bore you with telling you what's in that application, I would rather you ask me questions of anything <clears throat> that you have, questions about the application what I want to do, and I'll answer the questions. How long have you been a business owner, Ruth Ellen, and uh, in the city of Pittsburgh? In the city of Pittsburgh, we opened our little mom-and-pop retail shop in the brand-new Colonnade building. In, <laughs> we were one of the first tenants there wow. in um, 19, October of 1981. So you have a lot of time invested in downtown. Yes, and we opened our wholesale division in... 1985, yes, that's the same year I had a baby, um, and I opened a, a, our wholesale division, which until two and a half years ago was located on the second floor of the downtown building, and it has grown so large that there was no space in the downtown building to hold the wholesale anymore, and so we went to the industrial park, and I bought the wholesale division, a 50,000 square foot building out there. In your vision for downtown? Downtown's evolving. It's not what it was in the 40s and 50s and the 60s and 70s. It's not what it was when I came to town in the 80s. And it's going to continue to evolve. It's changed through the years. I've watched it change through the years. From oh my heavens to Betsy, everybody downtown really needs an awning of those shakes shingles. That didn't catch on. <laughs> Thankfully. Because now we all look at that and go, oh, God, that's such a horrible idea. But it's a continual change and evolution. We don't have the same customers that we used to have. The baby boomers are getting done with spending their money and their downsizing. <coughs> and now we have millennials. And millennials shop differently than baby boomers do. And I think it's real important that as a downtown business area of business and professionals and religious places, and services that we offer that we concentrate on the people that want to do business in the downtown area and provide them with the opportunity to purchase the services and products and food that they want in the downtown area. So it's not going to be stuck in 10 years where it is today. It's going to continue to evolve and change and it's going to look different. And that's really exciting, and I want to still be a part of that. I have a very important question to ask. How do you feel about birds? <laughs> you know, when we came here in 1981, there were birds. 
And there were trees, not the same trees we have now. We had worse trees than what we have now because they had Camerons and those things you could trip on and really hurt yourself. But we had birds. And you know what? I grew up on a farm. I don't know if, if you didn't grow up on a farm, maybe you haven't noticed, but birds poop. <laughs> and it's not pretty. And it makes a mess. And I would love to have a solution to birds and the mess. And I'll be real honest with you, I don't think there's a permanent solution. Because one option would be to whack down the trees. Well, we've got a block away trees that are in people's yards. And the birds are going to be there, and they're going to come downtown. There's no permanent solution to them. Well, Ruth Ellen, you was there long enough to remember the, one of the solutions they came up with for the bird problem was sending the, the city fire department out with a propane cannon. <laughs> and when that went off, I think there was more of a mess from the birds if we would have left them alone. <laughs> and all that did was send them to your neighbor business tree maybe half a block away. So uh, hopefully that's not in the plans to bring back the bird cannon. I, I don't remember bombing them with a cannon. I remember... Um, well, it didn't really bomb them. It was propane like a potato gun. And it made a hell of a noise when it went off. Huh. And, uh, I must have been real busy raising children and growing my business because you I really don't that at remember all. I know that Mike Simons. I remember, I remember where All Aboard is now. They put huge nets over their trees right. to try to get rid of them. Well, yeah. And then the birds ate holes in the nets and, you know, we have it. We're not getting rid of the birds. We just I, need. I mean, just, just realistically, it's not going to happen. We just need bigger birds. We need some bigger birds to come in and yeah. smaller yeah, birds. Actually, I have, been visiting, I have been visiting with someone who is still currently on the board because this obviously is something that, you know, has gone on for a really long time since, I don't know, Eden. And um, there is an option of bringing in some birds. And I think it's going to be a real exciting project. Um, I'm involved with an organization called Ducks Unlimited and know a lot of wildlife biologists and kind of things like that. And they don't deal a whole lot with pigeons. But they have, have and a lot of the information that I've been hearing from one of our current board members is following with what I've been told by my wildlife biologist friends on a national level. And I think it's going to be real exciting when hopefully we, the board, gets to bring that recommendation to you. I have another question. I think, there's a, I think there's a possibility of less birds, but I don't think we're going to totally eliminate them all. Another question I have, and it's just another comical thing that I'm going to say. Did the loud pil polka music that was played downtown yeah. have any effect on the birds? <laughs> there were no Do birds you know, one of the advantages of getting old is hearing goes away, and I never heard it inside of my building, of my store. The only time I ever heard it was when it was going on and I was at a committee meeting at the uh, place where I worship, which is the First United Methodist Church, and we were in the parlor, and if you know where that is, that's kind of on pine, and, and the windows were open because it was a nice day, and I actually heard the polka music, and I went, huh, that's kind of annoying. But that's one of those things that was a real catch-22, in my personal opinion, was that ordinance was passed for the convenience of some business owners without the, the thought of, it wasn't just going to be advantageous to them, it could also be disadvantageous because they weren't the only ones that got to take advantage of the noise ordinance. Right. And I think maybe it just wasn't thought out real well. It, the polka music's gone, isn't it? I don't hear it in my yes. store. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Okay. But I don't dance, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not native to Crawford County. I can't do the polka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Think Thank anything you. else? Nothing. Funky door. I'm going to still be on the infrastructure committee. I'm not going away. Bye. <laughs> okay, everybody vote for one. Yep. Patrick. Okay, by the narrowest of margins. In a drum Ellen. roll. Drum roll. In a drum roll. Pigeon strategies and okay. all of her historical knowledge will be serving on 
the board with your motion and yep. who is it? Ruth Ellen. Ruth Ellen. Oh, okay. congratulations, Ruth Ellen. Ruth Ellen. Okay. Patrick, I'm Ruth Ellen. <laughs> I know who you are. I've been around as long as you have. Almost. Okay. Wait, can you make, do we need a motion in that? Do we need a motion? Yes. Okay. Motion, second. Vote, please. Make a motion to approve uh, the nomination of Ruth Ellen to the what was that? Downtown, yeah. Downtown yeah. Advisory Board. Advisory Board. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, appoint to Land Bank Board of Trustees. Due to the resignation of a Land Bank Board of Trustee member, the appointment of a new member is needed for the term beginning immediately and concluding on December the 31st, 2021. Appoint one new member to the Land Bank Board of Trustees. Okay, I believe all the applicants are here to uh, kind of give you a update on who they are and why they're interested in the land bank board. I uh, just wanted to clear up, I had a question about the type of position that had to be on the board and I believe when the land bank board was um, originally put together that was just a suggestion so there are no position requirements or anything like that. So uh, okay. whoever's ready. Go ahead. Look forward to each one of you speaking to us short in short presentation. <laughs> <laughs> emphasis, on short. Be, emphasis on short. Emphasis on short. Hi there, I'm Chris Forsyth. Hi, hi, Chris. Uh, I transitioned to the area in 2017. I purchased a farmers insurance agency office on Broadway. I've been involved in the community since. Did the leadership at Crawford County um, in Rotary Club, um, and I've uh, been a leader in some past boards. I um, come from the Bay of Missouri, so I was involved in some boards there. Um, this kind of falls in line with uh, my current career as an insurance agent, and also I do some uh, property investing too, and I've started kind of investing in the area. Um, something I'm passionate about is renovations and improvements, and I look forward to serving on the board uh, this coming year. So do you have any questions for me off my resume or anything? No, I think your resume was <laughs> okay. informative. Anybody? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Chris. Josh? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk with you <clears throat> this evening. I was under the impression that this was an opening for the construction seat on the board. Uh, that's why, with my background, I decided to uh, apply for the position. My name is Josh Lorenz. I'm a superintendent for Crossland Construction. Uh, have been with that company for 12 years now, uh, working on projects all over the Midwest, uh, the state of Kansas, and specifically Pittsburgh. <clears throat> I come from a construction family where, you know, I grew up in the trades, working with my dad. I kind of developed an interest in high school shop class, then really refined that into a, a profession through Pittsburgh State University in my time there. Uh, then. I've spent some time around town working on projects uh, such as the facility we're in here tonight. Uh, this was a project I worked on during my college uh, days. I've also worked on the fire station number one, um, performing arts theater at Pitt State. Uh, spent quite a, a bit of time doing the structure there. Uh, the student center at uh, Pittsburgh State University uh, and a number of other facilities around town. So. I would just like to use my, my experience in construction to, uh, you know, really help out the community. You know, this is where I'm from. This is my hometown. So my wife and I are both pretty adamant about, you know, really investing in our hometown. Uh, of course, as with anybody, you know, there's always opportunities to leave after school. But uh, we always wanted to, you know, invest in, a, in our hometown, and this is an important place for us. You know, we're looking forward to raising our family here, and uh, community is important. So like the opportunity to serve on the board. Do you all have any questions? No. Thank, Thank you, Josh. Yes, all right. Thank you. Absolutely. Good evening. My name is Brad Snow. I came here in 1981 and thought I'd be here four years, and I'm still here. <laughs> so i uh, been at Watco Companies for 18 years, uh, 15 of those in VP of Real Estate. Uh, the last three years, I've been president of the All Board Foundation. Uh, our mission there is to make the communities we serve a better place to live. So that's my job now, is to get on boards like this and 
help make the communities a better place to live. Uh, I'm blessed because I get paid to do that. So we uh, have the All Board Center on Broadway that we still would like for you guys to come and see. We think it's a, a great thing for Pittsburgh. We do have our last commitment for that building, so it is full. We'll be full in June, so we're excited about that. We have eight different organizations and 30 different people currently in that building, and they're all non-for-profits, of course you know. Uh, I'm a former chairman of the first downtown advisory board. I was the second chairman, but I was on there for the, the first ever downtown advisory board. I am the current chairman of the Pittsburgh Farmers Market. Uh, so I've been involved in a couple different city committees. Obviously, I like them because I'm here. I think uh, I came to Watco in 2000 with six railroads, and today we have 48. So I spent a lot of time in VP of real estate negotiating contracts, looking to see what we did with property for uh, 42 different railroads in basically about 39 different states. So I think my reason for wanting on here is how do we market the properties that we currently have? I think the city's done a great job of tearing down a lot of bad houses and, and real estate, commercial real estate in this town, but I think also there's a lot more to do. And what do we do with those properties after the city becomes owner? And I think that's where I, my expertise from being VP of real estate would come into play is how to market those properties and get them back into somebody's hand and build something with them rather than being empty land like we have at 5th and Broadway or 5th Street and different locations. So that's what I'd want to bring is a marketing aspect with my real estate experience for those properties. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Brad. Thanks, uh, thanks Brad. Okay, we have a tie. Uh, you guys have extra ballots? Yes. yes. Uh, please only vote for Chris or Josh. Josh Lorenz. Congratulations. 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 I make a motion to approve Josh Lorenz as the uh, land, bank. land Bank Board. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of Josh being on the Land Bank Board? Vote aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, Josh. Move on to, uh, what the heck do we call this? <laughs> Bi-monthly budget review. Director of Finance, Jamie Clarkson, will provide the February 28, 2019 bi-monthly budget review. Good evening. Commissioner. Good evening, Jamie. i got to find my file again here. Is this what we all have on the back of our packets? Yes, it is, sir. Okay. Uh, it's still early in the year. I'm, I'm here to present the, uh, the budget review through February of this year. Uh, it's two months of the budget has, has been used up uh, about 17% of the year. 
I, too much uh, really doesn't give you much of a trend to follow on a lot of things. Uh, everything's looking well at this time. Uh, I don't have anything that's highlighted in red that jumps out. Uh, a few things I might note is uh, the special alcohol and the special parks funds. They're in the green, but it shows zero percent revenues. That's because we collect the revenues quarterly from the state. I just got the first, uh, the fourth quarter of 2018, just last week. I got it in March, so that'll show up on the next uh, bi-monthly in uh, April, at the end of April. Also, the uh, uh, the public utilities expen expenditures is at a 25 percent already, but that's due to uh, some debt payments that were due and. Uh, uh, February and also uh, some encumbered funds for some upcoming uh, water line projects. We went ahead and encumbered the funds against the budgets, so I'm not really concerned there at all either. Uh, we started the year at 13.4 million. Uh, currently, February 28th, we're at 16 million uh, in in cash in the bank. That will be spent down as we go through the year. Uh, a lot of the uh, money that was collected from property taxes is distributed in January and June of each year and most people just pay half and half so we got half in January we'll, we'll collect the second half in June and then it'll be spent down as we go along. Uh, sales tax collections are uh, performing well so far uh, for the first two months. Uh, through, uh, they were up 9% after January compared to January of last year but February compared to February we're, only, we're up 3. Point. 8% now, which is still great. I have 2% in the budget, uh, but it, it's early. Franchise uh, tax collections are, I'm projecting, are going to be down a little bit this year because of uh, uh, some electric merger credits that were put on uh, everyone's electric bill, uh, which reduced the franchise collections. Uh, gaming revenue is up 5% compared to where it was same time last year, so the casino is doing good. well as well. Don't really see any issues. Uh, anybody got any questions on anything? I got a couple. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you can make these numbers a little bit bigger? <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is, what is the revenues per month we're getting from the casino now? Uh, it's about twenty-eight five, twenty-eight thousand five hundred. I'm you. projecting we'll probably get bring around three hundred forty-five thousand dollars this year in casino. For the year, yeah. Terrific, Jamie. Thank you. Appreciate all this all right. information. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Jamie. Any other? We can't bring anything else. That's the end of the video. Uh -oh. Okay. Can't do it. We can't do it. Do I have a motion for adjournment? We can do that. Yep. I move to adjourn. I second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all. <laughs>